Our session today, we'll look at demand, supply, and market mechanisms. To start with, what is a market? Market is a system of buyers and sellers for a commodity that can be bought or sold. So in a market, we have the following players. We have a seller, we have a buyer, and these ones come in form of individuals, firms, factories, dealers, or as well as agents. So the term market really may not per se refer to a physical place. Market for a good or service um, can also be virtual. So as long as there's demand for a particular commodity, we're dealing with a market. So there are a few basic features that you need to understand about a market. A market needn't be situated in a particular place or location. The buyers and sellers not always need to personally meet each other. This brings us to what is called the theory of demand. Now the theory of demand really brings the following players, okay? Quantity demanded and the price. There's a relationship that exists. So in our today's context, most people think when I demand a particular commodity, it's a wish or a desire, but it's more than just that. So when we're dealing with the term demand, it's not a desire or a want, it is more than just that. In economics, we can say demand should be backed up by two key things. Number one, the willingness. Number two, the ability. So if an individual wants a particular commodity and they have the money, only so will you say there's demand for a particular commodity. Therefore, we can therefore say that demand simply is, refers to the quantity of a good or service that consumers are willing and are able to purchase at different prices during a specified period of time. So demand should always be made reference to price. Demand should also have period of time reference. So consumers must have the necessary purchasing power. Without that, there's no demand. And consumers must also be ready to exchange money or any form of money for commodities that are desired, then and only then would we qualify that to be demand. So there are a few determinants that demand usually has. So for purposes of estimating the demand in a market for goods and services, you must have at least some basic um, knowledge about what are the determinants of demand for a particular commodity and what is a relationship between demand and those particular determinants. So we're going to look at several factors that affect demand. To start with, price. Price affects the demand for a particular commodity in that it is inversely related to its price. This means that a rise in price will bring in a fall in the quantity demanded and vice versa. So for any normal good, should the price go up, you demand less of it. If the price goes down, you demand more of it. No wonder we often see supermarkets show commodities at a far corner, especially in shop right, reduced to clear because of this law which says as we reduce the price, people's purchasing power will be higher. 
And by purchasing power, we simply mean the value of money being more, since it can afford more goods. So there are two effects that we will need to come to terms with. There's what is called the income effect, is what we call the substitution effect. So we are done with the first factor that affects demand, which is the price of that particular commodity. The next one is the price of the related commodities. So the only two related commodities that we need to know can either be a substitute or a complementary good. What is a substitute good? What is a complementary good? Anyone? What is a substitute good? What is a complementary good? Okay. A substitute good is simply a good which can be used with equal ease in place of the other. These are goods which can be substituted for the other. For instance, you can substitute um, Coke for Pepsi if you don't have any Coke, a ball pen, an ink pen, coffee, or tea. All right, so these have the same usage. So you substitute one for the other. These are called substitute goods. Now, when we're dealing with elasticity for substitute goods, they have a positive elasticity because once the price of one good goes up, the demand for the other good will increase. So that's why we're saying the substitute as a positive elasticity because of the positive relationship. What am I saying? If we're dealing with commodities that are the same usage, like a cinema with the clinical and fresh view, the price at the clinical goes up, the demand at fresh view will go up. So there's a positive relationship. One rejoices over the price increase of the other. And when we're dealing with complementary goods, these are goods whose utility depends upon the availability of both goods used together. Anyone who wants to give us an example of a complementary good? What is a complementary good? So complementary goods are simply goods which work hand in hand. For instance, car, yes, Lungo, what example would you give us? I can give an example of um, conflicts and milk. Yes, conflicts and milk. All right, which other example would we have? Um, bread and margarine. Yes. So these ones move hand in hand, phone, SIM card, car, fuel. So what this happens is they have an inverse relationship. This means if the price of petrol goes up, what happens the demand for cars? The demand for the cars will go down. Why? Because these work together. Without one, the other becomes useless. So we call that a substitution effect. All right, then we go to what we call income. Income is denoted by the letter Y or M or I. So for any normal good, we should know that there is a positive relationship or a direct relationship. Let me say not positive because some of the goods have a negative. So for any 
no more good when your price when your income goes up you will demand more of that so an increase in income will be accompanied by an increase in the demand for the particular good so these will hold for what we call necessities and luxurious goods so food clothing shelter once your income goes up you want to buy more food you want to have more clothing so beyond that we call them luxuries luxuries are now extra additives that you can do without for instance an aircon luxurious car so all these have a positive relationship so elasticity between zero and one will be for necessities. Above one will be for luxurious goods. So we'll discuss elasticity of demand on its own as a topic. There are a few goods which have a negative response. When your income goes up, you'll do the opposite. Those are called inferior goods. Inferior goods are goods that will demand less of because we are able to afford better. We are able to go for superior goods. We are able to substitute for something. And as such, we incur an inverse relationship. So your salary goes up, you say goodbye to Salaula clothes, goodbye to curse cost sort goodbye to other inferior goods. Maybe you were driving a Corolla, those old models, your salary goes up, you go to a new model, you go to Mac X, and these are goods that you get to buy. So the other good that you substitute becomes an inferior good. So as a managerial economics manager, you need to really understand the nature of the good, the relationship that will exist between the quantities demanded and the changes in the income. So you also need to know what kinds of goods usually people switch for. Of course, in economics, we say holding all other things constant. Those days, you would agree with me, it's a carpenter, you have a pena. But these days, if we're going to ask too much of the fat that has been eaten, you'd want to rather go for carpenter these days, not because it's a good living, or want to go to have, um, what other goods? Think about that. So we are rebutting that notion, say holding all things constant, because we don't want to bring in complex uh, issues like taste, or maybe I don't eat that. But the idea what we're trying to say is that only inferior goods will be demanded less of as your income goes up. Are we together? Anyone behind so far? Are we following? Miniva? Okay. So when we go to tests and preferences, these are other key determinants for demand. What you wear, what you have on you really with time pertains to your tests, your habits, your disposition. So demand for particular goods sometimes just goes with tests. For instance, in this modern era, certain goods that are fashionable go with persons what test. Of course, there are a few effects that you could also attest a test to. There's what we call a bandwagon effect, where the buyer wants to buy a good because others have it. You hear of a Gucci. And you want to get it because it's the most happening. Everyone is talking about a Gucci. So we call that the bandwagon effect. 
some goods also undergo what we call the snob effect where individuals want to be the only ones having the commodity the ones who buy a particular brand they will not buy it they will actually throw it away because they want to be the only ones so that is a, a prestige component and we call that the snob effect the other one is called the veblen effect where people want to buy highly priced goods only why because of the prestige or ostentatious uh, consumption, the conspicuous. So we call that the Veblen effect, which comes from um, uh, Thorsten Veblen, he's the one who came up with this. Of course, there are other effects that may be internal or external, but the fact is that test really is a factor that affects your demand for particular commodities. So other factors that we could look at are the composition and the size of the population. Sometimes even a larger population could have low demand, but the composition would be who is there. For instance, teenagers would go for a particular kind of music and clothes. Sometimes the old age would go for a particular kind of what? Uh, demand. All right, of course, generally, the larger the population, the higher the demand. All right, then we go to the other ones, such as the national income. National income and its distribution will also affect the demand for particular commodities. In Zambia, we know that certain areas like Changombo, of course, then even distribution of wealth is just as far as statistics are concerned. But uh, there are certain regions where we know there are more people who are earning high. So the demand will be higher. In others are sociological factors. These ones that will do with your background and your education and your marital status, your locality. These are sociological factors. But or so it also has to go with some also psychological factors. Other factors could be weather, you know, buy ice cream when it's hot, buy umbrellas when it's raining, other conditions, advertisement, when you advertise more goods go higher. Government policy, for instance, certain commodities that have no tax will buy more of them. Sometimes the government would want to discourage smoking, they put high tax on it and then you buy less of it. Others are expectations of the future prices. So if you are told that at midnight fuel will go up, you go line up and buy more of it. Trade conditions as well who affect the demand. For instance, we have what we call Homesa or Sadek region where certain taxes don't apply because you want to enhance trade amongst countries of that region. Sometimes the consumer credit uh, facilities and interest rates, certain commodities that come with after sale services accompanying them would, for instance, call for huge demand. At one time when uh, Ajando was starting, there were certain added services that people prefer that give us drinks then, I don't know if some of you remember, or give you water. And instead of going to the other power tools, you'd rather go for Majando because you're going to get a free drink. So these are key and determinants of demand. So we came up with a function that has dependent and independent variables, which we call the demand function. So we have demand of X against the price of X, M, which is what? Income, price of substitute good, price of complementary good, as well as what? Um, test and adver advertisement. So, these are the factors that affect uh, 
demand. So we are now going to look at a function of demand in terms of the law. So demand always has a negative relationship between its price and it is given by demand is equal to A minus BQ. So this is a slope. This is called the inverse demand function. So demand is always down sloping because of the what? In this relationship that exists. Okay. So the slope is usually negative. So we have our demand function being given by P A minus B Q. The demand function can also be given by this format. A minus BP. This is what we call the direct demand function. This is what we call the inverse demand function. So demand is down sloping because of the inverse relationship that exists between price and quantity demanded. So what this means is the higher the price, if we increase our price from P1 to P2, our quantity demanded will decrease from Q1 to Q2. And this is the other reason why elasticity of demand is always negative because of this inverse relationship. A quick, can you remember, can you give me the determinants of demand, any five determinants of demand? Number one, what are the factors that affect demand? And, uh, Charity, Lungo, and Miniva. What are the factors that affect demand? Yes. Income. Income. Price. Price. The price. price. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Income. You said income, yes. Letter M. The substitute. The price of the substitute good, yes. Anyone else? Any other? Miniva? Determinant of demand? We said price, income, um, test. Okay, test. All right. What else? Advertisement. Advertisement, yes. Population. Population, yes. Population is generated by N. Weather. Weather, yes. Exactly. So, what is an inferior good? What is an inferior good? <laughs> Anyone, charity? An inferior good is, um, is one I think who's demand um, reduces when income increases. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. What do we call that effect? Yeah. Income effect. All right. What is the snob effect? What is noted by the snob effect? No one? What is noted by the snob effect? What is the income effect?
Okay. So, snob effect arises when people buy goods. It's under test. What did we say? Or what's the bandwagon effect? Bandwagon is um, when everyone else is buying, when a good is being bought by a lot of people, then one also wants to get it. Okay, great. So we mentioned also that besides the fact that demand is down sloping, there are two effects behind that. There's what we call the income effect. This is when the price of a good falls, the real income of this consumer will increase in terms of commodity. That's why we have a downsloping curve. So it increases the purchasing power. So at the base here, where the price is low, the purchasing power is high, so we buy more goods. The other one is substitution effect, which arises when the price of a commodity falls, it becomes cheaper compared to the other substitute. So people will substitute and more people will come here. So if you had a good, like uh, you, are, you are dealing with candolo. Cal candolo is more because bread went up. So that's why we have a huge down sloping uh, demand down there. So we also spoke about the factors that affect demand, like the price of the product, price of substitute and complementary income, preferences, population size, weather conditions, all these affect demand. And um, we looked at demand as being down sloping. So demand also works on shifts. So the movement along this curve is because of the changes in prices. But when your income goes up, we're going to have a shift in demand. So when we shift upward, it means your income has gone up. When we shift inward, it means your income has shrinked. We have what we call the contraction and extension. So the change in other factors of uh, demand will result into a shift in demand. So this shift is caused by changes in income. So apply on the other hand looks at suppliers as well on the supply side. So supply has a positive uh, elasticity because of the positive relationship that exists. The higher the price, the more suppliers or producers are willing to sell at a given price, per unit time. So the law of supply simply states that for any commodity, if a product increases in price, the quantity supply will increase. If it decreases, in price, the quantity supplied will also re reduce. So this is the law of supply. So the reasons are number one, a higher price is more attractive or profitable. So this means that firms will be encouraged to produce more. This happens FRA. Whenever they declare a good price, more farmers are willing. Also at a given time, if the price remains too high, new producers will be encouraged to participate and therefore production will be higher and the total market supply will increase. So the supply curve looks like this. So for every increase in price, there'll be an increase in quantity supplied. And the determinants of supply, what affects supply? Number one, the price of the particular commodity. If it's high, quantity supplied will be high. Number two, the quality or the type of technology being used. Better technology will increase productivity. Number three, the weather conditions. We know that productivity is high in certain seasons, like a rainy season for agricultural products. Other factors could be the prices of other commodities. So in supplying, whenever people are more expensive than yours, you attract more. So in the prices of other products, uh, are more. Products which are more profitable attract more investment than the unprofitable products. So we've heard of people wanting to do soya because of the prices being high. Government taxes and levies that are levied 
So high taxes will lead to low production. Then producer subsidies. So sometimes when government comes through with subsidies to tend to encourage farmers to move in supplying more. Then when we go to the movement, these two undertake movements along the supply or a shift depending on what is being done. So a shift in the supply can move from S0 to S1 or S0 to S2, depending on the factors of um, the factors that affect supply being altered. So the effect of the change in price on the quantity supply will simply cause a movement along the curve. All right, this one is along, but the changes in other factors other than price will actually cause a shift of the entire uh, supply curve. So there are factors that affect um, supply to movements along and the factors that affect supply to causing a shift. Now, if these two parties are left uncontrolled, the consumer would want to exploit the supplier by going as low as possible. And the supplier would want to exploit the consumer as going as high as possible. But these two need to meet at a point which is called equilibrium. Equilibrium is the point at which the consumer meets the supplier. This point here is called equilibrium. The area above, below the demand function is called consumer surplus, I'll call it A, and I'll call this B. So if I have numbers here like 18, and here I have 15, and here I have nine, and here I have zero, and here I have 10. This area here is called the consumer surplus. And this area is called the producer surplus. The area is simply a triangle, which is given by half times base times height. So our base, in this case, is the distance from here to here. So what is our base? From here, the distance to here. Okay. Hey. What is the... What is the, the base? Then from here to here, it's a height. And from here to here, it's a height for the other triangle. So we have two triangles here. We have this one and this one. So if you're looking at area A, what is the base? 10. So half times 10. Then what is the height from 15 to 18? Three. Three. And what is the height for the other one from 15 to nine? Six. Okay. So the base is 10, the height is three. We get 15 as our consumer surplus. Then the producer surplus is the same formula, half times base times height. Our base is the same 10, we are sharing the same base, but the height is what? Six. So when we multiply that, we're going to get that. So when you total up that, it's called the total surplus. The total surplus is 45. So adding the consumer surplus plus the producer surplus will give us what we call the total surplus. All right, so I can use um, figures to illustrate. So if we're given the demand function, demand is equal to 100 minus 2Q. And the supply we're given as what? Supply is equal to 10 plus 3Q.
So we need to draw these two curves. So at equilibrium, what happens? We'll say that equilibrium, what happens? Sub supply and demand needs. Demand is going to supply, correct. So what is our demand? 100 minus 2Q. And what is our supply? 10 plus 3Q. So we'll put the letters on one side. So this 100 will subtract 10. And this 3Q, when the 2 will go this side, it will add. So what do we have this side? 90. And what do we have this side? 5. Five. And we divide on both sides by 5. What becomes our equilibrium? 18. So our equilibrium quantity is 18. Since this is equilibrium, we can put this 18 here. We can put this 18 here to get the equilibrium price. We will still get the same answer. So this is 100 minus what? 2 times 18, which is 36. Or 10 plus 3 times uh, 18, which is 54. Any of these will give you the same answer, which is 64. All right. So we know equilibrium. What happens? Demand and supply meet. Demand is down sloping. How about supply? Is up sloping. The point where they meet is called what? Equilibrium. So price is always here and quantity is always there. So we found our equilibrium price as what? 54. Our equilibrium quantity we found here as what? 18. So which one is the consumer supply between A and B? And which one is the producer supplies between A and B? A is the consumer supply. Okay. Supplies. And B is what? A is the consumer surplus. Then B? The producer surplus. Yes, producer surplus. Now, the question is how do we plot equations? For instance, we're given P is equal to 100 minus 2Q. You put the letters on one side. P plus 2Q is go to 100. So we look at the number. What number is below 4P? It's a 1. So we know P always starts from here and Q is there. So 1 into 100 is 100. So just go 100 there, you put your dot there. And what number is before Q? It is a 2. 2 into 100 is 50. 50 somewhere here. And just join the two points. Huh? You're done. Then for the supply, we're given 10 minus what? 3Q. I said you put letters on one side. We're going to have P plus 3Q is got what? 10. What number is there? 1. So 1 into 10, our P is what? We're going to cut at 10. For the 3, And this was plus. So when this one comes aside, it was we subtract subtraction. So negative three. Negative three into ten. Well, did cut the Q at negative three. So negative three is somewhere here. Positive ten is somewhere there. And you join. Uh, so this is how we find the intercepts. Can I repeat that again? Two 
to draw Please do. equations. For instance, the demand equation here. So the first thing is you put the letters on one side, the letter is here. So this minus 2q, when it goes inside, it will be plus 2q. So I want to know why to cut the p and the q. These are called intercepts. So the number that is at p is 1. So 1 into 100 is 100. So to cut the p at what? At 100. The number that is at q is 10, is uh, 2. So 2 oh. into 100 is 50. So on the p, you cut at 100. On the q, you cut at 50. Is that clear? Yes. Then for the supply function, the 3, you to go this side to subtract. So what number is on the p? Is a 1. So 1 into 10, it is 10. So that's why we put 10 there. Minus 3 into 10 is minus 3.33. 3. So this is where these figures are coming from. So here, although we don't like using the negative side, we're just going to consider this 100, 10, and 50. So when we go back here, we just say here there was 100, here there was 10, and here there's 50. Now we're able to reason together. So the area A looks like this. What is the base? From here to here, 18. 18. What is the height from here to here? This was 64. <clears throat> so here we get what? 36. Okay. Then supply at B here. What was the height here? From here to here, the, the length. The base was 18, but from here to here, 64 minus 10 is 54. So I want mm -hmm. you guys to calculate for me the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. Quickly, I will give you just two minutes. So this is how we find our consumer surplus and the producer surplus and the total surplus. This is how we find the consumer surplus, producer surplus, and the total surplus. So you need to know how to do the sketches, how to find the equilibrium. Okay. Are we together? So let's go to example and see how we can uh, answer some questions in case they come. So here we're told that the market has a demand function 12 minus 0 0.5 QD and the supply is 0 0.5, 0 0.1 QS. Can somebody lead us? How do we find our um, Equilibrium. What are we given? What was our demand? P is got what? Four minus zero point five Q. And our supply was given by what? 0.1 Q. All right, so who wants to lead us? How do you find the equilibrium? Come on. Geneva, where are you? Sharon, demand is good to supply. So 12 minus 0 0.5 what? Q must equal to what? 0 0.1 okay. Q. So here we're going to have 12. Here we're going to have 0 0.5 what? Q plus 0 0.1.
but here 12 is equal to 0 0.6. Q. So what we divide both sides by 0 0.6. So here we're going to have 0 0.6, and here we're going to have 0 0.6. We divide that, divide there. What do we get? Our Q will be 20. So how do we find the P? Substitute them in any of them. You can put it here. 0 0.1 times 20. What do we get? We get a 2. So to sketch it, since this one has no intercept here, supply will be like that, demand will be like that. So how do you plot the demand? P is equal to 12 minus 0 0.5 Q. So when this one goes inside, it will be P plus 0 0.5 Q is equal to what? 12. What number is there? There's one. One into 12, put 12 there. What number is there? 0 0.5. 0 0.5 into 12, we get 24. Here we are at zero. Why are we at zero? Because here we only have P is equal to 0 0.1Q. So there's no other number there. So when you put these letters on one side, you're going to have P minus 0 0.1. 1q here they remain zero. 1 into 0 is 0. 0 0.1 into 0, all of them will be starting from 0. Then where they're meeting, what was our equilibrium price? Equilibrium price, we said when we put 0 0.1 multiplied by 20, our equilibrium price was what? 2. So price is always here and the quantity is always down there. So here on the price, what are we going to put? Two. The quantity, what are we going to put? 20. Between X and Y, which one is our consumer surplus and which one is our producer surplus? Between X and Y, which one is our producer surplus and which one is our consumer surplus? X consumer, Y Yes, X consumer, Y produce. So how do you find the consumer surplus? X is equal to half times what? The base is 20. The height is what? 18. 10. 20 minus, minus, we get 10. So we get 100. How about for Y? Half times 20 times what? Times 2. We get 20. Then the total surplus will be 120. Okay. So I will end here for now. In the evening, we'll continue. Uh, to finish up unit one and unit two. And I'll give you exercises to try for unit one and unit two based on these questions. So, so I plead with you to put extra attention. This is math. This is math. So you need to really practice. <laughs>